I guess we got another minute here. That was everybody's first day of classes. First days, I guess, if you had a Tuesday class. Awesome. <clears throat> good, 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 good. Pretty neat. Cool. I'm glad to hear you're all at least doing reasonably okay. Um, one thing I should mention, I don't know if you saw the emails go out or if it's just for faculty. Um, if any of you need to run from like an online class to an in-person class and you have, you know, the, the 10 minute break, um, it's possible to reserve like small classrooms or conference rooms, I think, for you guys. So if you need that, let me know, um, and I can try to set something up for you so that you're not just like, you know, sitting in the lobby and getting distracted and all that. Um, there is a way to basically take care of that. So a um, couple of administrative notes for you all. So Friday, I, I'm going to send out an announcement. We'll do it over Blackboard Collaborate. Um, you don't necessarily have to turn your camera and your mic on for that if you're not comfortable with it. I know not everybody is. Um, I'm, I'm an introvert myself, so this whole being on camera thing is kind of interesting for me. But we're going to do a project team group session, so we're going to try to form all of your project groups. And we'll also get started with an in-class lab. The more important part is for you all to, you all to meet each other, basically. And... Obviously, you can't do that through Twitch, um, and you don't have an easy way to see who's in the class in Blackboard. So what we're going to do is we'll do that. I'll send out an announcement with everything that you need to know about that. So what I wanted to do was to just show you a couple of things in here that I've added based on your suggestions. So on the course information tab here, I've added two things. So there's a calendar and a class roster here. So this hopefully is helpful for you. This is a terrible implementation. So if there's another way that you've all seen in other classes, I'm more than happy to know. But in between asking other faculty and Googling frantically for this, I couldn't find a way to see who's in the class. So if you click roster, you see this nice blank page. And what you have to do is you just click go and then everybody shows up. And if you have shared your email address in there, uh, I, th I think it's in your profile, then that will pop up. So if, you know, you want to or don't want to, I suppose that's up to you, but I'm going to guess that a good chunk of you might know each other at this point. If you don't, uh, you feel free to use like the Discord channel or, or something like that to meet up. And I also learned there's a, a GVSU Discord channel too, which I will try to also keep an eye on as well. So we have this roster, so this is one way for you all to see who's in the class. And then we also have this calendar which should hopefully be helpful for you as well. It's going to take all of your deadlines and pop them in there. I'm used to a system where it just automatically tells you that you have a deadline coming up. So if there's something in here that's missing, please let me know because uh, I'm going to try to keep up with it from your perspective in, in Blackboard, but this seemed to be the best way to handle it outside of like making my own website and going outside of the Blackboard environment. I kind of wanted to keep everything in one place so it doesn't get too crazy for you all. So uh, what we have, so tonight that FERPA release form is due. Again, it's worth points, so please fill it out one way or the other. Friday, your exam preferences survey is due since um, uh, it, it's more of a helping me make decisions for the class based on your feedback. This is going to be worth a little bit of extra credit for you. And then you have your first homework due next Tuesday at midnight. So that will be due in Blackboard. It is an individual assignment. And... I will pop that up here right now. So if you looked at it before, the ethics articles weren't posted publicly. They are now. So you should be able to do everything in this homework. So this is going to be the way that all of my homeworks are going to work for the class is that I'll give you a handout. I'm going to ask you to fill it in. I'll try to be nice for you and put in bold and red what I'm actually looking for for the assignments. So basically like here, What's your Discord name? Create a GitHub account. What's your GitHub username? I'm going to use this to just, you know, make sure that I know who is signed up for what, and then I can assign you to groups and all of that fun stuff. 
the real meat of this homework assignment is a little bit of a reading reflection, ethics reflection on some of the articles that I posted. So this is one of the super important things about software engineering. It's the engineering aspect. And this is, if you get to the higher academic level, there's lots of arguments as our programmers engineers or not, uh, depending on where you're at. So that's, that's a fun argument. I fall on the side that you are engineers, whether you're called engineers or not. Software engineering is in the title. I'd like you to read these three articles. So there's a Therac 25. We'll talk about a couple of these today too, but there are some horrible things that have happened with radiation poisoning. It's really below for some reason. On the camera or the, the, the screen? Is that any better? Is it my video or? Doesn't look terrible. Okay, I was just zoomed out. Okay, my fault. My resolution shouldn't be terrible. Sorry about that. I'm trying to not be seem like I'm horribly inept here. Personalize is that one. Desktop two. What are we at? Yeah, 1920 by 1080. It's about the best this monitor can do. Um, let me. Yeah, I just zoomed in here, so hopefully that's a little bit better. This is up on Moodle. Uh, again, it's under the assignments line in there. So basically just give me a paragraph for each of these topics, what you think. So who's at fault? Why are they at fault? What should have been done differently? This is a wonderful look into actual engineering too, where you know it's fine to screw up as long as nobody got hurt or millions and millions of dollars weren't lost. But what could you have done better? Right? What was missing? What was the problem? Kind of go back and reflect on what could have been, basically. So that's these three. I do have a note for Therac as well. So Therac25.pdf is a very long article. You don't necessarily have to read that one. Um, it's more for your personal knowledge if you want to know more. It, that's like the super in-depth article of everything. There's a, a couple of other ones which are more high level, which give you exactly what you need to know. So just a note that for that one. And then lastly, thank you. I like my wallpaper too. <laughs> I like to change my wallpaper based on my current mood. So sometimes we get the little cardboard box man looking horribly depressed when it's uh, being a rough semester, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll change that randomly. So then the last thing too is to form a project team and come up with a team name. Now, obviously, we haven't met each other yet. If you don't know everybody, you can fill this in after. Again, we have a, a week to do this, and it's due Tuesday night at midnight, basically, next week. So team members, team name, please try to keep your name safe for work, more or less. Uh, don't, I'll, I'll let you know if it's a problem, but you can be cute with your team name too. Just keep in mind this is something that will be posted on your public GitHub repository. So don't, uh, don't put anything up that you wouldn't want a potential employer to see, but you can be cute with it if you want. Uh, it's worth 50 points, and that's pretty much it for the homework. It shouldn't be too bad. Mainly read and reflect. Try and uh, actually think about what we're what these articles are giving you. So we have the calendar here. Hopefully this is helpful. I will also add in uh, other other things as well. So let's let's do this right now uh, in Blackboard. Collaborate session. So let's let's actually do this. So Friday, maybe. Mm, I'll do this later, so I don't screw it up in the middle of class here. Uh, I'll I'll try to put our special sessions in here, and maybe that'll be be helpful for you all too, so that we can all keep track. So I think that was about it for Blackboard. Everybody, anybody have any questions or issues with? Any of the tech set up so far? Is everything making sense? I'm noticing some activity in the Discord channel, which is good. Had somebody drop by my office hours on Monday, which was also nice to see on day one. So we have lots of options for you, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, so for Friday, we're going to do, again, a lab, and we'll do our, our project. So what we're going to do now is we will get through some of the content. I'll give you my scared straight lecture, and that'll be the plan for today, pretty much. So what I'd like to start with is a question to you all. 
Now, we ended last time talking about increasing complexity of software. Uh, we talked about how things are just getting more and more feature rich. And I left you with this figure. The cost of software is going up effectively linearly. You know, this could be more or less exponential depending on your project. Cost of hardware is going down. Does anybody know why there is this disparity between these two figures? Why is software getting more expensive? Why is hardware getting cheaper? I suppose depending on what hardware you buy, it might be more expensive too. But um, think production scale, perhaps. Since we're streaming on video, this is actually like a real life Dora the Explorer where I get to just stop and stare. Outsourcing labor, Moore's Law. Hardware is getting cheaper because the cost of R&D is up front. So yeah, these are all actually great answers. Software is becoming more complex. Yes, so all of these are absolutely correct. With hardware going down, we can start to scale up production and reduce costs at, at the industrial level, right? Now, if you're getting into crazy things like GPUs, this kind of becomes an interesting figure because once people learned they could use GPUs for Bitcoin mining, the cost of hardware went up, but that was that specific domain. Uh, software is going up because, again, more complex, more feature-rich, it requires more support, feature updates, you know, all of these things, which you probably have heard about and experienced with software, but it's getting more and more expensive. <clears throat> so why is it hard work? <clears throat> Excuse me, why is it hard and expensive? Software should be free, right? You just go out and download it or um, uh, not pirate it. Let's, let's not say that, but basically the growth in the number of features, inputs and outputs, right? So anytime that we have an increase in something, there's going to be some kind of a dimensional growth. And what does dimensional growth mean? Um, Think of how many people have to be employed, how many lines of code have to be maintained, how many test cases have to be run. You know, there is just a whole lot going on here. Right? And when I say running test cases, that's not just your simple Java unit tests. I've gone to some basically conference talks by people at Facebook. If somebody submits a change to, to a Facebook, you know, either the app or the website or something, it goes up into a pipeline of testing. And these tests take days to run, not minutes. So maintenance, ver verification, validation, these are non-trivial topics. So anytime you add something, you have to go through the whole process again, basically to make sure your change didn't break something else. So think of the size of some of these software applications. And I really need to put, I used to have a, uh, there we go. Let's get this guy. That's a little bit better. So we have different levels of complexity in software too. Think of something trivial. So if you've done a, a basic programming project, you know, you've made your RPM calculator or, you know, your simple hello world phone app, whatever you're doing, not a lot of code. It's just you, maybe you and a partner and it, it's pretty easy to verify, right? Then you start scaling up. So very small, small, medium. So you're getting up into the numbers of lines of codes are increasing, the number of people are increasing, the number of interconnected features that depend on each other are increasing. So software just keeps getting more and more and more complex. And, you know, whichever of you that are out there that have used something like Node.js to program, you probably are already aware of the dependency hell you can get into with that. Same for Python packages too. Uh, this is a good note for me to tell you that if you're going to start getting into these complicated projects or even sim simple ones, uh, make sure that you note what package version numbers you're using. So Python has a requirements.txt file, rip Angular. Yeah. I, I have not actually tried Angular myself. I'll leave that to the uh, those of you with extra energy. Um, but make sure that you know what versions go to what, because I've had projects that I tried restarting after three years and it just broke everything because the packages were inconsistent. I'm sure you're all going to appreciate that if you're any kind of Python, mobile, JavaScript developers. Anyway, as we go up in complexity, thousands of programmers, 35 million lines of code, 15 years for a project. 
Uh, Y2K updates are a great example of this. Go through every bit of software that has a two-digit year code instead of a four-digit. Uh, you have a very large process here. And then you have this ultra-large scale, which is kind of cool to talk about in theory, but super complicated. Again, completely connected healthcare systems, intelligent transportation systems. These are your smart cities talking to your car, talking to the road and the bridge, and there's sensors everywhere. They all have to be working correctly at all times. Otherwise, well, you crash into a wall or something like that, right? So these things get very, very, very complex. Now, what's the problem with this? Okay, we're programmers. We are doing our best. You know, we're not cutting corners. The problem here is that software actually becomes very, very difficult to maintain over time. So you do your release. Life is great. You find your edge case a year later. Nobody even thought of this combination of parameters. Your testers missed it. Your automated scripts missed it. Now you have to go back and fix it. Right? So. Maintenance is a very tricky task because you deliver your project and you think you're done. Well, you're not done. This is basically a long-term support thing. Uh, cost estimation and scheduling is also difficult because you don't know how much extra effort you're going to need. This is the, you know, kind of the quality side, the, uh, the um, you know, the software project manager type side of things. How much do you have to pay for this project over its lifetime? And then here we have some examples as well. There's the Ariana missile, which crashed at startup basically after it launched. Um, we have a mishap at the Denver airport, Therac 25, we're actually going to talk about here momentarily. Uh, basically, it's not just programming. There's things like budgets, schedules, documents, um, team issues, functional issues, non-functional issues. All of these things can result in problems for your project that you have. All right. So um, basically, yeah, so we're not really going to go into some of these too much right now because I'm going to talk about them momentarily. Just keep in mind that your software is not just writing code, you know, going on Stack Overflow and finding the answer, which I still do too. As a uh, you know, fully functioning human being, we all need help with that, but we have to make sure that it's being written correctly. So some case studies here. First, let's look at the Ariana 5, and this is why I didn't really want to go into it, because I have a lovely gif of what happens here. So this rocket was created by the ESA, so the European Space Agency. This was a huge project, 10 years, $7 billion for a rocket to go up in the sky, right? A minute into launch, this thing explodes. 10 years down the drain, $7 billion down the drain. And this was USD, not converted to uh, euros or anything like that. Why did this happen? We have this rocket, which many professional engineers worked on. Again, they know exactly what they're doing. What happens? Somebody's trying to stuff a 64-bit number into a 16-bit variable. So we are losing precision, right? So you don't have all those extra bits to track um, you know, the, the decimal point, basically. So what happens? we see this. So we basically have some kind of a buffer overflow, or maybe we, you know, I don't know exactly what happened to cause the exact explosion, but you start, no, I'm sorry. Let me get this out of the way. There we go. Move down there. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> yeah, you got to see this. So improperly handling your variable precision causes this to happen. Something that you might have been able to find with like a lint test or a static analysis, right? It's, this is one of those warnings that half the time you just ignore because it's fine. It's just a warning. All right, so here's one thing that happens. The Prius braking. So I'm not sure if any of you... Remember this one, this was several years ago. We have our Toyota Prius, that lovely, as the hybrid vehicle. Um, what happens here is that we're getting into brake by wire, which is meaning that braking is an electronic process, not a mechanical one. Okay, so what this means is that it's software controlled now, it's not necessarily hardware controlled. 
when you get into these embedded systems, everything has to happen in real time. If you've taken an operating systems class, I'm really hoping you've talked about real time operating systems, but that's where you don't have all the overhead of the operating system doing things. You're actually scheduling tasks to happen and they have to happen in lockstep, otherwise delays occur. So here we have a delay in our brake software. Think of it this way. You're traveling 60 miles an hour down Lake Michigan Drive because it's 55, right? So of course you're going to go 60. Now, <laughs> global variables, there you go. Um, you're, you hit your brake pedal and then you don't start braking until 90 feet later. So if you're going 60 and it takes you 90 feet to start slowing down, there's going to be some pretty significant problems here. Now this is actually being caused in the analog brake system. There is a lag there which starts to build things up and we basically have this horrible, you know, kind of avalanche effect of problems happening. So again, programming is not always just a, a fun thing. And then here's kind of the big one, which you know, pretty much every software engineering class in the world talks about. This is a case where somebody is going for chemotherapy for radiation treatment. And the problem here is that the machine is overdosing patients with radiation. So it is actually even, even worse because this is something easily preventable. So Therac 25, this is a chemo machine, the Therac 25, um, and this is an older case study. So this is the early nineties, basically. Um, this is an iteration. This company comes out with a new model. It's the new and improved version of the Therac 6, which is fun to kind of think about if you're a Dilbert um, aficionado. Sorry, spilled coffee everywhere. Uh, just the numbering scheme. But basically, everything is now software controlled. And you know, if we end up talking outside of class, this is my nightmare with autonomous vehicles and everything. You need a mechanical backup. <laughs> software is, uh, it's, it's fun. Um, but basically, everything is now software controlled. There is no more mechanical backups. All the safety mechanisms are software. They're electronic. There's nothing mechanical to prevent problems. But if you look at it from a business perspective, it's a hell of a lot cheaper. Everything is software controlled. Software is free, right? You don't have to buy all these extra parts. So from a business perspective, life is good. This machine was also tested extensively over years. Many years, this thing was verified, it was tested, it passed all its use cases, uh, it passed all its test cases, its models, everything is good. But one programmer wrote the entirety of the code base. Again, early 90s, late 80s, this is pretty common, right? You look at old Nintendo games, these are one, two, three teams, people are teams of one to three or something like that. So one person wrote all the code for this machine. Unit testing and software testing was minimally done, meaning it was done, but there was a minimal, minimal amount of these cases, right? So that's kind of our, our setting here. And I'm pretty sure this article is actually one of the ones that I have in your, uh, your Blackboard too. <coughs> Excuse me. So there were 11 units installed between the US and Canada. So we have two different health organizations overseeing these things. And during the time that they were out there, there were six massive overdoses reported. Um, and this means that somebody went for chemo and they got blasted with radiation. What happened? So there was a prior iteration from the Therac 20. So there was the six, we're at 25, there was 20 in between. Um, this code was copied basically wholesale from the 20 to the 25. Um, Faults occurred that were never detected before. Why were they not detected? Well, there were hardware interlocks, meaning that there was a mechanical backup that prevented the machine from ever overdosing somebody. However, now that those are gone, these faults come to light. There is no safety mechanism anymore. So this overdose, basically it's like you, you hit a button, this is how much radiation comes out. Okay, so that's what happens. Why did this happen? From a software perspective, we have race conditions and concurrency errors. So again, going back to operating systems, we have shared memory, we have variables. And I'm sure as you're all aware by now, and if you're not, um, 
Don't have two things access the same memory space at the same time, bad things happen. What bad thing's going to happen? Well, the problem is you don't really know. So, program intelligently and smart and avoid things like race conditions. Uh, we also have a human element. So this is where the engineering comes into play. Uh, you have your users, right? They're going to use your software, and they're going to use it quite differently than you anticipate. OK? Problem here is that the medical staff, who are not engineers, they're not programmers, they're not using it like you think they would, um, they didn't even think the machine was the problem. So they just kept hitting the button. OK? So. This is also goes to a training issue. So the staff and the nurses here are using shortcuts or they're hitting a key multiple times, which causes the machine to go into the wrong power mode. Meaning that what's happening is that we are continually commanding this machine to up the radiation, up the radiation, up the radiation, up the radiation. Um, nobody ever expected somebody to just sit there and hammer out a key you know, multiple times not paying attention. Right, they're sitting there testing it one by one by one. It's fine. Nobody's ever going to be not paying attention, trying to get their job done as fast as possible. Right, so these are old PDP 11 computers. Basically, you have like one of those old VT 100 terminals, which most people are probably not going to be too familiar with unless you get into at like administrative type things or older legacy systems. Yeah, you have to idiot proof your code. <clears throat> the problem is that nobody you know, was intentionally doing this, right? So they're trying to get their job done as fast as possible so they can go into the next patient. They assume that these programmers weren't going to, you know, make it in, in such a way that it's, it's going to be bad for the patient. So idiot resistant, there you go. <laughs> I'm going to allow this. My auto mod is very, uh, very active, so. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on that. Idiot resistant. I like that term. I've never heard of that. Uh, so what does this tell us, basically? This is where we go back and reflect. So we're actually um, going to talk about what happened to the patients, too. Staff ignoring patients who thought something was wrong, too. So yeah, basically, they didn't think the machine was the problem. They thought it was just some weird edge case until there was an investigation that happened afterwards. So eventually, they did come back and pinpoint. So what does this tell us before we get into the bad stuff? OK, so the engineers were not incompetent. They were not um, bad. They were just slightly negligent. OK, so there was a lot of effort in designing and creating these systems and testing them. Right. This was done over several years. Um, what this does tell us. Yes, there, uh, I'm not sure if I, I, I don't know about the legality here. So that one I'm not sure of. But basically, this tells you that testing is never done. OK you are never going to find every single problem in your software. And there's a great quote from one of the software engineering uh, greats out there that if you find no bugs, that just means that you found the absence of bugs, or basically you haven't found it yet. There's always going to be a bug. Uh, several years ago, they found a bug in C's Hello World program after like 20 years of it being a standard program. Um, <clears throat> So if we look at this, you know, look back at a couple of these problems here, could a lint test have solved Dariana 5? Probably. Linting, I didn't know about linting until I went into industry, but basically it's making sure that all of your variable types match. It's making sure that you follow your coding standards for your company. <clears throat> so basically, it tries to find all these kind of logical errors. Um, second point here, could extensive human testing have solved whatever catastrophe? Possibly, right? But again, there's always going to be somebody that finds a combination of inputs that causes catastrophe. Look at the, uh, you know, all these crashes we're seeing with Tesla's autopilot. People are thinking autopilot means autopilot, and really it doesn't. It's a horrible name for a semi-autonomous system. Um, their machine learning algorithms think that the side of a truck is actually the sky because it's all white, right? So there's lots of issues out there that is really hard to see from a programmer's perspective. Um, verify and test as much as possible, but you also have to put a lot of effort into training too. So if you're a software engineer or a quality engineer, part of your job might be to write a training manual. So 
obviously for the doctors and their nurses here, they needed to be trained better, right? They don't necessarily know. Um, yeah, so I'm going to actually get to the, the nasty stuff here in a moment. Uh, so software engineering, and this is my kind of little spiel here for you. <clears throat> I can guarantee at some point you're going to get horribly bored by this, by me, by my monotone dry voice. Um, this is some of the horrible dry stuff. We're going to talk about UML models. We're going to talk about requirements and technical writing and all of that. Super, super dry stuff, you know, no excitement, no sex appeal here. But I would like to make the argument to all of you that this is the most important software class that you will ever have. Not mine, maybe, you know, maybe you don't like me and you take a, a different software engineering class in the future. But this is where the responsibility of what you're doing actually comes to light. <laughs> well, I, I used to, my, my dirty secret is I also have a, a degree in computer engineering, so um, I, I agree there. <laughs> um, but keep in mind that we're not just writing fart applications, right? We're writing break controller code. We're writing chemotherapy controller code. Um, you know, you might be writing stuff, you might go out to GE, write aviation code or uh, electronics code in your house. This is all going to have impact on people who have no idea what's going on behind the scenes, and you have to make it idiot resistant. I love that term. That's my new favorite term. Thank you, Wuggy. <laughs> um, for this, though, this is my stance. I'm more than happy to die on this hill. I think programmers should become professional engineers because you have stuff like this happening. I know that you all can go for the uh, the order of the engineer ceremony. I did years ago, but I don't have my ring anymore because it doesn't fit. But keep in mind that all the stuff you're doing, people will be impacted by it. Um, if not their lives, it might be their money. I have a friend who I did, uh, I went to grad school with. He went off into the, uh, he went off into the day trading. So he's uh, basically one of those high frequency trading firms or something like that. He had a bug in his code and people lost millions of dollars in seconds. So you have a lot of responsibility as programmers. This is my scared straight, uh, basically lecture. Okay, so be very careful. And I'm not trying to say the same thing over and over, but this is so important that you understand the implications, uh, especially now that things like automated machine learning and you just go grab somebody's model off the internet and you have no idea what it's doing. Um, stuff like that scares the crap out of me that nobody actually knows what our super advanced algorithms are doing. So I want you to put yourself in the shoes of this programmer. I programmed the Therac 20, which is ported over to the 25. I now know that I caused severe radiation burns. I know that somebody had to have one of their breasts amputated. Um, somebody died of an extremely virulent cancer because they were massively overexposed. So you know that you're responsible for this and you have to live with that. I don't know what the legalities were uh, behind the scenes here. I have to assume there is some action taken because there is some negligence here. Um, the other thing here too, which I didn't have in the slides, the person who programmed this was also the tester. Okay, so think of that, that for a moment. I wrote this massive code base I'm also the one who tests it, meaning that I know how to make it work, right? So this is why you always have a different person test your code or a different person read over your documents because no matter how good you think you are, you always get kind of this laser focus on making it work, not necessarily finding the crazy edge cases, right? That's why we have testing departments and we have quality assurance departments and things like that. So that's the end of my soapbox here. Now, let's talk about actual software engineering, OK? So real world concerns for real world systems is how I'm going to try to contextualize this for you all. So why do we need software engineering, right? Obviously, the points that I've just made make a case for it. Real things will happen to people. Um, I've got a list of points here. I'm not going to necessarily read them all because I know you can all read too. But basically, software engineering is going to improve the quality of your software. It's going to help with our predictions for cost estimation, which 
in the business world is a huge chunk of why we do anything, right? And we want to kind of have this balance of meeting demand, lowering costs, and being able to actually make functioning systems happen. When you think of software engineering, think more of a process that you're following, okay? So you're probably all familiar with the terms Agile and Scrum and Waterfall. And if you're not, these are basically ways that businesses make software happen. But this is how we move around the different aspects of the software engineering process. When do we do requirements engineering? When do we do testing? When do we actually build the thing, right? How do we change it when problems occur? All right, so there's a, a bunch of different processes. Everybody thinks their own is the best, obviously, because they came up with it. But the point is that whatever process you follow, if you do something wrong, you're going to kind of destroy this process, OK? So I've got some of these uh, uh, semi-official laws here, which are always fun um, for me as a very jaded and sarcastic person. So first of all, everybody knows Murphy's Law, right? If something can go wrong, it will. This doesn't just apply to software engineering, but it's very, very obvious here, right? You don't uh, validate some input. You don't do the correct you know, type conversion. Something will go wrong. Somebody's going to find that problem. But then we get into the even more cynical ones. We got Hofstadter's Law. It always takes longer than you expect, <laughs> even when you take into account Hofstadter's Law. So any of you that have embarked on a, uh, a passion project or a personal project, that'll take me two hours, and then I'll be done. And then three weeks later, you're still working on the uh, login screen. Uh, we have Parkinson's Law, which is a fun one, too. Your work expands to fill the available time that you have. So if I've got five hours today, you know, I'm not teaching, I'm not watching my kids, I don't have to do any housework, I'm going to spend this time and build procedurally generated map. Well, I did that, and then I have to add the NPCs, and then I have to do this, and then I have to do this, and then I have to do this, and then my five hours is gone. So basically, if you have a block of time, it's probably going to be filled with something here. Uh, this is a fun one, uh, again, a nice, nice cynical one here. Adding manpower makes it later, even later. So you probably have heard the joke that, you know, one programmer can get a job done in 10 months, two programmers can get it done in like 16 months or something like that. So don't be the manager that just adds people to a project thinking it magically ends quicker. Um, there is a, a semi-risque joke about, I think, pregnancy and getting it done in one month versus nine months, too. But I don't remember the specifics of it, and I don't want it to be a horrible botching of, of something like that. Uh, and then, software gets slower, faster than hardware gets faster. So coming up in the 80s and 90s era of computers, where we had to work with kilobytes and megabytes of memory versus you know, the lovely gigs of RAM we have now, and it feels that computers are slower than ever. <laughs> um, think of all these nice electron programs that just eat up your memory, and uh, you have Wirth's Law. So we have a very cynical and jaded professor here. I apologize. That's my real-world implication, or my real-world uh, history here. OK, we got 10 minutes, so we should be able to get through this. Uh, so I'm going to kind of speed through some of these slides, but basically a lot of the next bits are going to follow this particular model that you see here. So we have basically a little graph of various aspects coming together to form engineering. So this is the model of engineering, basically. Very famous, published in the 90s. We start out with craft, meaning that you have some kind of a craft that you do. right? You're a, a home brewer. You can make fire, uh, you can make a wheel. You start out with something very specialized. It takes you hours and hours and hours to do. I saw a really cool Reddit post the other day of somebody doing a Red Wings logo with a, uh, a scrolling saw. Um, and the comments were, everybody wants to buy it. They love it. It's beautiful. You know, nice stained clock. And he's like, yeah, but it would be so expensive that there's no way I could sell this thing. It took me a lot of time to do, and there's no way I can scale it up. Okay, great example of that. So you have a craft here. Uh, those of you that are Etsy shop uh, people probably understand the difficulties in scaling up to demand. That's where production comes into play. We figure out how to take this craft and scale it up so that everybody else can use it. 
And once we do that, we go into the commercial space and oh, science comes into play. So we start learning the theories and the underpinnings of why things work. And then we turn this into engineering. And so we kind of have this almost like a bone model. I don't actually know what this type of figure is called now that I think about it, but we just have an evolving model. All right, so what are characteristics of craft? You have your virtuosos. Um, we have a lot of brute force algorithms, which I absolutely appreciate. Um, you might have haphazard progress, which means I jump from point to point to point to point. And the fun part here, I love this point, extravagant use of available materials. I'm going to go out and buy the absolute best, most expensive, prettiest chunk of living wood for a, a beautiful art piece. Um, and my problem is it cost me a grand to buy that or something like that, right? There's no way this is scalable. So your craft is your, you know, very specialized people. Um, to bring it back to video games, you know, not everybody loves that, but think of virtuosos, you know, like John Romero uh, from the early 90s where they were really, really great at making this one game. And then start doing other things and it kind of falls off. <clears throat> okay, so we move into commercial. We start adding in procedures, refinements, trainings. Think about economics and manufacturing. This is kind of the process that we're trying to get to here. All right, so I'm going to kind of skip over this um, because the important part is that we go from craft to commercialization to professional engineering. This is where we start understanding the theory of things. We have highly educated people analyzing why things work the way they do. Um, not just in the mechanical engineering domain or the civil engineering domain. We're also going to talk about this in terms of software. And the only way that we can move forward once we get to this point is to understand all the theoretical underpinnings of why something works and how we can move it forward. And right now, the kind of explosion that we're starting to see um, in software engineering, at least, is we're getting into quantum computing, right? This is we're just getting into the theory, you know, the professional side of things. How can we take all of these crazy quantum gates and make them usable? You know, the hardware's kind of there. We have virtual machines. I know nothing about it. I, I know that uh, a lot of very intelligent people are really good at that, but I really, really suck at matrix math, so I'm probably not going to be a great quantum uh, physicist or anything like that. But that's kind of the step we're at there right now. Right? So we can take these standard engineering theorems and apply them to other engineering domains too. So we have civil engineering. And we start off in the crafts. Our Romans are building aqueducts and bridges and all kinds of really interesting architectural things out of the materials they have. And we start scaling it up and you have your aqueducts running into France and all that. 1700s, we start learning about statistics, material strength, statics, dynamics, um, analyses, all the things that go into civil engineering. And then we have the field of civil engineering, basically. So now we know how to accurately predict what an arch can hold strength strength wise right we can build all these crazy structures that we have because we understand the theoretical underpinnings <coughs> just need 600 ps3s this time around nice has anybody taken the uh, ps5 and made it into a, a cloud computer or a cluster computer yet I still want to build a, uh, a Raspberry Pi bramble of like a hundred Raspberry Pis just stacked, you know, being able to do the thing that one normal computer could do just for fun. Really? I thought it was out. Why am I? I'm not going totally crazy, am I? You're making me think I'm crazy. Until Christmas. Really? This is how I, much I don't follow um, physical games anymore. I bought a Switch because, well, you gotta got to have my Smash, but PS5 coming soon. Really? Huh. Well, thank you for that. Man. Elderly Professor dies on Twitch today. Yeesh. Okay, so the important part for you here is the software engineering. So we are evolving. Again, craft, meaning that we have very specialized applications. We don't necessarily know what we're doing. We just know that it works. We scale this up in the 80s where we start bringing in 
our various processes and methodologies. So how do we make correct software? And we start learning about all the algorithms, all the logic, all of our crazy databases we have, right? Now your, your task is gonna be to go beyond, you know, it's traditional SQL and learn about all of these document-based databases and graph-based things because those are almost becoming the norm or something like that, right? So, you know, we're at the point here where you are all studying the future of all these crazy design principles that we're getting out of science and you're going to have to apply them in an engineering oriented fashion. So how do we take these quantum computing ideas and apply it to something like a space shuttle or to an autonomous vehicle that needs to make a million decisions in a microsecond? How do you do that? Uh, that's going to be the tricky part, right? <clears throat> So the purpose of this class is uh, we're kind of getting towards the end here. Um, there are two real large pillars, aspects, whatever you want to call them for software engineering. There is the process and then there is the theory. We're going to focus on the process here just to set that context. So I'm not going to make you go through all the crazy theory aspects. It's going to be more of a grad level thing where we can make grad students sit horribly bored and learn the actual theory. I want you all to have the practical knowledge that you can take into industry and just use right away basically. So we're going to basically focus on the process. Um, and what does that mean process-wise? I just realized I keep saying um over again. It's horrible from a uh, presentation perspective. But we have multiple aspects of software engineering here. We have the definition, meaning we need to figure out what we're building, how we're going to build it. And then, yeah, sorry about that. It's like, uh, I, I need you all to make make sure that you're still breathing or something like that. And then you notice you keep breathing over and over again, and it's maddening. Lots of little things like that are fun to do. OK, so here are the common aspects of software engineering. Okay. What are we building? How are we going to do it? Did we do it right? Um, do we? How do we maintain it, fix problems that we introduced during any of these prior phases? And then we have a bunch of kind of overhanging procedural activities that we have to do along of these. My tongue doesn't sit well in your mouth. Oh, no. I'm going to be thinking about that for the next uh, four minutes. OK, so as we get into some of these aspects here, I'm going to kind of zip through this because I want to uh, we're, we're pretty much much done here. But we have a requirement side where your developer has to understand everything about the application, and we have to be able to specify it in natural language how we're going to do all this. I need a requirement that the user must enter only letters and numbers in the text box for the first name, right? Or special characters if you're going to support non-Western languages. So you have to understand your domain. You have to be able to define that in a requirement. As a software engineer, you're also going to have to do project planning meaning using things like Visio or Microsoft Project if you have the Microsoft license. I'm not going to force that, so we'll use open source tools for this here. But how are you going to estimate work costs? How long is this project going to take you? You, know, you have to try and figure that out if you do something like a Gantt chart. What hardware are you buying? What software are you going to use? Do you have to get any modules? What are your users going to do? You know, things of this nature. Uh, do, 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 do. So I'm just kind of skipping through the development phase because we're, in, we're going to be going through all of this. So high level user interface, what are the low level aspects? Um, we're going to have to write our code and unit test it. We're going to have to do integration testing. We're going to have to do lots and lots and lots of things. And then you have to do release testing. Make sure the entire system works as a whole. Maybe do some kind of crazy exploratory testing where you do you know, fuzzy based testing or search based testing. <clears throat> or you go to, uh, I don't remember what that, uh, there's a web application where you can just have random users on the internet test your application. And we have maintenance. So how do we find problems? How do we get user input? How do we fix them? How does that reflect back up into our, our other processes? Um, so how do, we, how do we manage all this? In these umbrella, umbrella activities that I kind of glossed over, these are things like your documentation, your version control systems, configuration management, um, all of these fun aspects here. And you can hear my children screaming because they're unhappy currently. Um, yeah. So where do all of our costs go? 
This slightly pixelated graph shows that the definition of our project is about, was this an eighth maybe? Then we have about a quarter for development and the rest of this pie is maintenance. So this goes to show you just how much effort goes into the various aspects of your project. Obviously it's a very generalized figure, but what we're trying to do effectively is minimize the cost, cost in various aspects. And this figure here shows the cost of fixing software errors over time. So if you have a software error at the requirements phase, it's very cheap to fix. Same for the design and imp implementation. Once you get to that release phase, once you get to that maintenance phase, it costs a heck of a lot more to fix a problem, right? Because the user has it now. It's not in-house actively being developed. Okie doke. So that's pretty much it for the intro material. Hopefully you know, everything makes sense. So Friday, we're going to do Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, I'm curious while I have you all here, have any of you had a Collaborate session for class yet? Because I was reading the uh, the GVSU Reddit and I heard a lot of unhappy people with Blackboard. Um, any of you have any problems with it? Or is it okay to use from your perspective? I've got a decent amount of people who have used it. Unsure how to use it, so we will see. It's incredibly mediocre. <laughs> okay. Um, we're looking for functional. So I've used Google Meet in the past, and that was not the best because there was not a lot of control with like breakout rooms and muting and stuff like that. Collaborate seemed okay with my uh, super, like I have two people in it. When it scales up to 30, I'm kind of curious how it goes. So we'll try it. Why not Zoom? I wanted to keep everything in Blackboard just so you have one thing. Um, would you all prefer Zoom? I guess to me it doesn't matter. I just want something that works so that you can all see each other and talk to each other. Yes, Zoom. OK. I would. Yeah, so, so the other thing too is that we didn't get access to Zoom until late in the summer. So when I was prepping class, I did everything in Collaborate and trying it out. So. Um, no preference. Zoom is easier for breaking. Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll use Zoom. OK, I'll put up a link and I'll do an announcement so you all know what to expect. But yeah, maybe we'll give Zoom a try. Sure. To me, it doesn't matter as long as it's usable. But anyway, so that's about it for me for today for you all. So again, homework's posted. Do your ethics reflections. Maybe keep the project team open until you are ready to fill that out. But other than that, have a wonderful day, and I will see you all on Friday. And look for the announcement in Blackboard. Bye, everybody. Need some nifty outro music. There we go. OK. Off topic question. Sure, I'll be here. So what's up? Is your profile pic at Oktoberfest? Um, the one with the little hat? That is, I have gone to Oktoberfest. Um, so I, I used to live in Germany for a couple of years. Um, the little hat is actually at Neuschwanstein Castle, I believe. So they had a bunch of little tiny alpine hats for sale. But uh, I, I did go to Oktoberfest once, and my experience was that it was mostly drunk Americans, and all the Germans were off having fun in the tents. Bilanga, Zweijaren. Sorry, Zweijaren. I was in the Bavarian area. Uh, Schwäbisch, Schwäbisch area. But it was lots of fun. Um, I actually went there because of work, so... I was working at an automotive company. They needed people for a Ford of Europe project. And I'm like, sure, sounds like fun. You show. Cool. Just like future, I'm pretty. <laughs> um, it is a classy affair. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> very classy. It's fun. It was a blast.
highly recommend it if uh, the world ever goes back to a normal state. But anyway, so office hours start at 11. So I will be in the Collaborate channel that's up on Blackboard. So I want expensive. Yes, that's true. Okay, I have a couple kids to go uh, take care of, and then I will be right back. So see you all then.